Many of the listeners of Unbiased are dissatisfied with both the political parties in the U.S. and wish that there were more options at the polls. Our guest today has a practical and well-researched solution for introducing more options at the polls and enabling those who are elected to have more freedom to achieve their campaign promises. Catherine Gell is a former manufacturing executive and founder of the Institute for Political Innovation, a nonpartisan nonprofit founded in 2020 to catalyze modern political change in America. She wrote a paper on a new format of elections called Final Five Voting, which she co-authored with Harvard Business School legendary professor Michael Porter. We're going to dig into the rationale behind this model, what it means if it's widely adopted, and what Catherine and her team are doing to make this a reality in the United States. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super happy to be with you guys today. So let's start with that article in Harvard Business Review on why the U.S. political system is dysfunctional. You said the problem isn't specifically a politician problem. It's not a policy problem. It's not even a polarization problem, which is what a lot of people like to blame. You said it's a systems problem. Why do you believe that to be true? What's your assessment of the cause and effect of polarization here? Politics is no different than any other human endeavor. Humans do what they're incented to do. So when we look at politicians, we say, why don't people in Congress work across the aisle to solve our most difficult problems? It's because they're not incented to do that. Let's put it this way. The way we elect people right now, the way they get their jobs, the way they keep their jobs, basically forbids them to work together. It forbids them to solve our problems because if they do those things, they will be less likely to keep their jobs. It's as if we ran our companies and we gave people a job description. We hired them. We gave them a job description. We said, here's what we need you to do to grow our company and to get our product to market and please our customers. And then we sort of whispered in their ear. And by the way, if you do those things really well, in two years, we're going to fire you. <laughs> so our election system hires people to go to Congress and we need them to do a certain job, solve our problems. And then we whisper in their ears and we say, and if you do, we'll fire you. It's just a crazy system. And that's why we have to look beyond the news that says it's a policy problem or a politician problem or a polarization problem and just look at the actual system so that we can understand it, but most importantly, so that we could change it. And so to build on that, and and first off, I think anyone who's listened to this podcast before knows that I'm a I'm a big fan of electoral reform, but maybe for those of us who aren't as well-versed or those of us who are new to it, can you talk a little bit about what are the aspects of the system that encourage polarization? There are two huge systemic problems in our political system. The first is we have party primaries. So when we're going to elect people to Congress in mostly the summer, the party primaries are held and we take one Democrat and one Republican essentially from those primaries and send them to the November election. But here's the thing about party primaries. In over 80% of races in the Senate and the House, those decisions are made. Who's going to win is decided in the party primary, meaning it's decided in the summer when only 10% of voters turn out. How this works is that in a Republican district, whoever wins the Republican primary in the summer, we already know is guaranteed to win in November. And we know the same in a blue district that whoever wins the Democratic primary is guaranteed to win in November. And the people who turned out in those primaries are 10% of voters. And those 10% of voters, both on the left and the right, tend to be more politically extreme than November voters, than voters as a whole. And so even though we think that these two sides, these primary voters on the left and the right, couldn't be more different from one another, there's actually one way where they're really very similar. And that is that both sides do not want the people they elect to compromise, to give in, to work across the aisle, or to do something other than the orthodoxy. And so when the decision is made by this 10% of voters on each side in the summer, they send those representatives to Congress with the instruction to not work together, to say we'd prefer gridlock, we'd prefer dysfunction over a compromise. And that's why we never get any of that behavior. And the second reason why we have a great deal of dysfunction is that there's no new competition ever. 
So probably a lot of your listeners are in business. I think it's really interesting that politics is the only industry where we're regularly told that less competition is going to be better for the customer, meaning for the voter, right? That we're only going to have these two choices and that we always feel we have the lesser of two evils choices. Whenever you don't have competition, then the players in that industry don't have to worry about making customers happy. And that's what we're seeing in the politics industry is that we have these two parties. And even though 90% of people are dissatisfied with Congress, there's no new entrance. There's no new choices. And that means they can keep doing what they're doing and they don't have to actually adjust in any way. Arjun, before you get to your question, there are two pieces of information I want the, the listener to know about. Number one, there's a great piece of research by an organization called Unite America called The Primary Problem. And it actually shows that around 80% of seats in Congress are determined by 10% of the voters. And it's due exactly to what you're, you're saying, Catherine. Number two, and I'll, I'll give you a real life example. So in my home state of Massachusetts, Massachusetts District 4, their most recent election for Congress was, I think, something like a five or six way primary on the Democratic side and resulted, I think, the, the winner won by 23% of the vote, I want to say, in the primary and went on to represent the district. So again, fine person, great credentials. I'm not slamming him as, a, as an elected official, but I, I would like to just you know hammer home the point as well that you made, which is that very often we have a minority of a district voting for somebody to represent all voters. Yeah, almost always we have a minority of a district voting for someone who elects all voters. And to follow up on your point, Dan, that makes it undemocratic. It makes it unfair, you could say. And we shouldn't want any of those things. But the real problem is that it makes it impossible for the people elected in that system to actually do the work of legislating because they can't deal with the complex trade-offs on the big, you know, problems that we have in immigration or healthcare or climate or debt deficit or infrastructure because they can't make any compromises because the small number of people who elected them are not willing to reelect them if they do that. So I talk about this as the tyranny of the party primary. Their behavior is limited by what's acceptable to this small number of voters. This may be a, a bit of a naive question, Catherine, but why is it that party primaries attract the most extreme segment of the party? Why isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know the numbers, but let me say something like 30 to 40% of people are registered as Republicans and 30 to 40% are registered as Democrats. Why isn't that big chunk showing up to the primaries? And if they did, would some of this problem go away? <laughs> it's a perfect question. I don't totally have the answer and I don't care that I don't have the answer, which mm -hmm. is to say, I don't need to know why they're not coming. I need to know that everything we've ever tried to help to get more people to turn out has never worked. Mm -hmm. So we just are gonna leapfrog over that problem and go straight to making the general election decide the winners. So instead of trying to get more turnout in the election that decides the winners, which is the primary, how about we just make the election that already has the turnout the November general election, be the election that picks the winners. I like that. So once I figured out that we could just do that, then I can stop worrying about, you know, uh, primary turnout. Having said that, I do predict that with the solution we'll talk about in a little bit, once primaries have more competition and are more fair and democratic, I actually think you'll get better turnout over, over time. But we will, with our solution, Final Five Voting, negate the worst effects of low turnout in the primaries. So this is a good opportunity. Let's talk about Final Five voting. Can you give us the highlights of what the system is? Yeah, so Final Five voting is the umbrella term for two changes to how we elect people to Congress. First, let's just get rid of these broken party primaries that we've just talked about. Instead, we'll have a first round election, one primary, everybody running is on the same ballot, regardless of party, and every voter can participate. Primary day, you pick your favorite, polls close, count the votes. And now, instead of advancing just one Democrat and one Republican, we're going to advance five candidates, the top five finishers out of that primary will automatically move forward to the general election. So now between the general, between the primary and the general, we're going to benefit from five competitors with different visions and candidacies and policy ideas representing potentially some different constituencies. We'll have this diverse dynamic debate. 
Then the second change we make is in the general election, because now that we've benefited from having five candidates, we need to figure out who's going to win. And it's not quite as simple as we might think, because what we don't want to do is accidentally elect one of those five with like 21% of the vote, which could happen if the votes but relatively equally. So we need to figure out which one of these five has the broadest support of the most number of voters. And to do that, we're going to use instant runoffs. We will use instant runoffs to get down to the final two of the five, and then majority will win. How that works is that voters get to um, indicate their preferences for these candidates all from their first choice, as in, this is my favorite candidate. You know, I really want Dan Sally to be my senator. And then sort of, well, if I can't have Dan, Arjun's pretty great, so I'll take him. And all the way down to, you know, my fifth choice, my last choice, over my dead body, do I want Catherine Gale to be my senator? And you just indicate your choices in that way. Then when the polls close, we use that information to conduct the rounds of instant runoffs. In round one, you count everybody's first choice votes, and then whoever's in last place at the end of round one gets eliminated from the race. And then if you had selected that candidate who's now been kicked out of the race because they lost, your single vote is automatically transferred to your next choice who's still in the race. And then we conduct round two with the four candidates. Then we eliminate the person in fourth place. And voters who had selected that candidate have their vote transferred to one of the remaining three candidates who's still in the race. And we do that until we're down to the final two majority wins. It's just like a series of runoffs, but instead of having to keep coming back physically for another election, you cast all your votes at once. So in sum, final five voting is a top five primary plus an instant runoff general election. And it results in the winner with the broadest support of the most number of voters. It ensures that November voters always pick the winner, and it ensures that there's a lot of competition to serve the voters in November. And then finally, it sends people to Washington, D.C., authorized by a majority of their district or state to actually do the work of legislating. People elected in this system are not forbidden to work with the other side because they won't automatically lose their primary if they do that. They're not forbidden to vote yes on a bill where they don't get everything they want, but they get a lot of what they want and they think this is the best way forward. If I could use one more example. Back in, oh, what year was it when we had the Simpson Bulls? It was a debt deficit commission put together by Barack Obama and then led by Paul Ryan on the Republican side. Long story short, it was a bipartisan commission, and it was the grand bargain of how we were going to rationalize our spending. And in the front page of the bipartisan report, there was a paragraph where all of the people on the commission you know, signed on to this paragraph, and it said, none of us agrees with everything in here, but we all think that this is the best way forward. So we're willing to give you know, some tax increase here on the Republican side, we're willing to give some benefit decrease here on the Democratic side, for example, and that that is the best compromise solution. Right now, those kind of solutions in the existing system, nobody can vote yes on them. Whereas under a final five solution, if that elected representative liked that solution, they could actually vote yes, and they wouldn't be guaranteed to lose their job. Do you know the funniest thing about Simpson Bowles is I actually spoke with a uh, with a woman named Maya McGinnis who heads up an organization called the Do you know Do you know Maya Catherine or, or no? I am a huge fan of Maya and I yeah. joined the CEO Fiscal Leadership Council when I was first trying to figure out what the heck was wrong with our system. Yep, I spoke with her for my other podcast. You don't have to yell. And one of the things she said is I asked her when did fiscal conservatism die. And she said Simpson Bowles. And mm. to hammer home your point, the fiscal state of America is, is, I would say, probably more dire today than it was during the time of Simpson Bowles. And yet the incentives are such that Congress could never enact a solution to it. The last time we had balanced budgets in this country and, had, and then ran a surplus was during the Clinton years. And what happened then? Ross Perot ran in 1992. Mm -hmm. And here's what we can see. Ross Perot got 19% of the vote, zero electoral votes. But what did we get from that competition? We, the country, got balanced budgets because that was what Perot ran on. 
And 19% of the country was willing to sort of waste their vote on that idea. And what that did is put competitive pressure on the two parties to address the issue, because neither one of those two parties wanted to cede that 19% of the electorate to Perot's nascent third party. So they were both pushed to deal with the issue. And I actually wrote about this in the Harvard Business Review article, and the Harvard Business Review editors came back and said, oh, you can't say we got balanced budgets because of that. That was because of economic growth and Clinton's economic advisors. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. Go look at Paul Begala's op-ed where he said, and I quote, I mean, it's from memory, but essentially, it is, this is Paul Begala, it is doubtful that we would have solved that issue without the pressure that Perot's voters brought to the table. Mm -hmm. So competition drives progress in all human endeavor. Like in tech, you know, you'll have a new company that creates a new innovation and maybe they're not the ones that win. They're not the ones that get the big market cap. They just get bought or the innovation gets copied, but the consumer benefits because the innovation is happening. If we never have any new competition, there's no pressure on the existing two parties to improve anything. And so again, the last major competition we had based on that issue was the last time we actually got progress on that issue. And if we don't open it up, it's not beneficial to either party to say, we should spend less. That's bad for their electoral prospects in the, in the near term. You know, one of the things you had mentioned as you were describing Final Five is instant runoff, otherwise known as ranked choice voting. And that's a reform that's gained a lot of momentum in recent years. What are the main differences you feel between, let's call it raw ranked choice voting and what you're proposing, Final Five? Instant runoffs is, you know, this system of having multiple candidates and having a fast and efficient way to determine who is the majority winner. And to do that, of course, we use this ranked ballot. So that's why many people call it ranked choice voting. It has been popular to implement ranked choice voting in party primaries and in general elections without getting rid of the party primary as the deciding election. And I used to support that. So I was a big supporter when Maine implemented ranked choice voting in their elections, both state and federal. Now I don't support it because what we understand as we really look at the system is if you put ranked choice voting into the existing system, it does make it more fair, you could say, more democratic, like the primary you referred to in your Massachusetts district where someone won with only 23% of the vote. You would have had ranked choice voting there and you would have figured out which of those candidates, you know, was going to get over 50 percent. And that might be more fair and definitely more democratic, but it wouldn't change what that candidate could do because the path to getting elected to Congress would still be to win your party primary when only 10 percent of who are the more politically extreme turn out. So we feel better about the person who's elected, but they can't do anything more for us as citizens because they're still forbidden to actually make deals, negotiate, innovate, reach across the aisle. They're still forbidden to legislate. So the use of instant runoffs is much more helpful when you combine it with getting rid of the primary and you get yourself five candidates. I'm pretty dogmatic about this. We should not bother putting all kinds of effort into ranked choice voting on its own because it won't change the results we get. I say it'll change who wins. It won't change what winners do. So one of the reasons that I find your solution particularly interesting is because it's not purely theoretical. We actually have some examples. And most recently in Alaska's special election for a House seat, uh, where uh, the congressman, I think, had died suddenly, and so there was an election. So it's similar. I think it's effectively final four voting there that just happened. Catherine, tell us about what happened in this, and did some of the theories that you have, did it play out the way you thought or did not play out the way you thought? What was the real-life example uh, that happened here? Yeah, so... You're right. The system in Alaska is a system of final four voting, which is exactly what I just described, except it's the top four finishers advancing out of the primary to the general election. And that's because uh, back in 2017, when I first published on this work, the best thinking was to use four. And I've since updated the thinking to go to five. Long story short, Alaska, um, an amazing man named Scott Kendall, Um, read my 2017 work 
And based on that and, and his other expertise, he designed a ballot initiative in Alaska to implement Final Four voting for all their state races, their state legislature, governor, lieutenant governor, and their entire congressional delegation, which is two senators and one congressperson. And the voters of Alaska passed that in November of 2020. So now their first elections are taking place under this new system. So we're going to see it in process of the election, and then we're going to see how the people elected out of it behave when they're in uh, Congress. And what you're referring to, Arjun, is the fact that the first election is already underway there. Their congressperson, Don Young, the longest serving congressperson of 50 years, passed away earlier this year. And so there's a special election for his seat. They just had the primary for that. And where they've had sort of no competition for 50 years, now they had 48 people in the primary. And uh, they had the highest primary turnout they've had in, I don't know how many decades, but, you know, ages. And they got it down to the final four. And the general election will be in August. Now, interestingly, in the final four, there were two Republicans, one independent and one Democrat. It's highly likely that in Alaska, they're going to elect a Republican because it's a red state. But what is really cool is that now the general election voters are going to choose which of the two Republicans they would like, because we all know there's different flavors of Republicans, right? There's different flavors of Democrats. So why shouldn't all the voters in November have the choice of multiple people from the same party to reflect really the diversity of views, even within the parties? One sort of detail, just to get it correct, is that the independent in the race, in the in the Alaska race, did actually pull out of the race. So now we are unfortunately down to three candidates in this. But we will see in November, all the other races in Alaska will be the final four races. And I expect we'll see four candidates in almost all of those. So it'll be real competition in November. And they'll get majority winners out of all of them. And those people will be free to serve their whole districts. It's really quite quite amazing. It's incredible because I think about so many theoretical ideas and papers that get written and I feel like they just collect dust. And this one actually got implemented. And I'm curious, especially in anything in the realm of politics, where we have so many brilliant political scientists who have so many ideas to improve things, but it feels like it never happens. How did this happen? Like, isn't there a sort of a, a default by the parties to resist change and resist the system's that got them into power? How in in the world did Alaska decide, you know what? Yeah, to hell with the old system. We're going to change this. Yeah, let's not just blame it on the parties. I think humans resist change, right? Mm -hmm. In general, but uh, you're correct. Yes, um, in an existing system, a lot of the existing players will resist change, even though I would argue it could be real good for them. It's another discussion. Um, How it happened in Alaska, though, is that Alaska is one of half the states in this country who have the ability to put questions directly to voters. So uh, actually both of you, so Arjun, you in California and Dan, you in Massachusetts, you have ballot initiatives there too. So referendums, initiatives, and uh, that's what they did in Alaska. They collected the signatures and they put the question to the voters. So the voters chose. That's a huge opportunity to bypass the institutional preference to keep this existing Mm. super dysfunctional system because people are optimized around it. I should tell you, by the way, we have multiple other campaigns happening now. So Nevada, which also has ballot initiative, we're going to know very shortly whether they have qualified for the ballot in November. And we have legislative campaigns in Wisconsin, where I'm from, in Georgia. We have nascent um, ballot initiative campaigns in five to seven other states in different stages. So by 2024, we expect to run a couple. I will see how many we end up with in 2024 ballot initiatives. And we actually hope we'll have some legislative victory, one or two by then as well. Getting back to Alaska, getting back to seeing this in action. And the statement I'm going to make is going to be kind of politically charged. So listener, just kind of bear with me. I'm not taking a stance one way or the other, but... If you look at how Lisa Murkowski behave, behaved in the Senate, and she, this is again, Republican Senator from Alaska, she made a lot of decisions that would be political suicide in many other states. I mean, she very, very openly uh, opposed uh, Trump when he, was, when he was president. And yet she can't be primaried out of existence because it's impossible to primary somebody out of existence in Alaska, or it's very difficult to. 
And so she has the ability to act independently. Now, again, depending on where you fall in the political spectrum, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. But I think every American is going to agree that they want their senator and their representative to represent them and not represent the national party. And so I would say, again, if you're interested in having your opinion heard, um, this is a method to ensure that your representatives act independently and really keep local concerns in mind uh, when they act. Lisa was, as we say, freed from the tyranny of the party primary, and she yeah. took advantage of that. And look, even in final five voting, it doesn't guarantee that Murkowski wins again. What mm -hmm. it guaranteed is that the general election voters in November in Alaska are going to get to choose. And if they would like Lisa Murkowski to be their senator, they can have her. And if they would like Kelly Shabaka, who Trump has endorsed as a challenger to Lisa Murkowski, they can have Kelly Shabaka. But they get the choice. Whereas previously, it was going to be a done deal that Murkowski was going to lose her primary and the November election voters were not going to have the choice of who they really wanted. So this is just a super democratic way of electing people that also turns out to be really helpful because the people elected from the system have a lot of agency in Congress. They can be the deal makers. And I want to flip that one on its head too, because getting back to the origin of the primaries, you know, they actually came to prominence during George Wallace. So when George Wallace actually, he broke off from, he was a pro-segregationist presidential candidate, broke off from the Democratic Party uh, due to their embrace of civil rights and almost through the presidential election into the House of Representatives. And at that point, the primaries were instituted to give the candidates, quote unquote, legitimacy. What we can learn from this, I think, is that generally when the partisan power structures threatened or generally when change is in their best interest to preserve power, is when they're most likely to embrace it. And, and a question I have for you, Catherine, is are there any signs that the current primary system is maybe causing problems for elected officials and that Final Five might be preferable to the system they use now? Yeah, let me talk to people as business people again. I think this party primary system is crazy bad for the parties mm -hmm. because it means that they don't actually get to control their own products and services and platforms in a sense. They have to take who this small number of voters gives them, which doesn't always put them in the best position to win in November. And it certainly doesn't put them in the best position to solve problems according to their ideology, because they're not allowed to, you know, make a deal to move anything forward. Let me take a slight tangent here. Former Democratic presidential candidate, Andrew Yang. I don't know if you've been following him very much, but he's got this new thing called the Forward Party. And actually, just this morning, he tweeted something about his support for open primaries and ranked choice voting. So I think it's very similar to what you're saying. I'm curious what you think about what he's doing with the forward party, which is really trying to add choice, but in a whole new party umbrella, it seems like. What, what are your thoughts on what's he, what he's doing and how it might affect or improve choice for us? Well, I, I love that Andrew loves um, top five primaries, instant runoff, although he'll call it open primaries, ranked choice voting. Um, and he does uh, cite my work extensively in his book and everything. So um, he actually called me up when he was writing his book and he called me up to tell me that I changed his life <gasps> because, you know, helping him see that this is the system problem. He had that same aha moment that so many of us do when we realize that it's the system. So, so having said that, then I'm super supportive of that. What he's doing with the forward party, trying to provide more choice, I, of course, support more choice as well, because I'm saying we need competition and competition drives innovation results and accountability. There's a bit of cart before the horse in the case where people are trying to start third parties or run independent candidates, because the existing rules of the system really mean that those efforts are facing a real uphill struggle because a third in the existing system is often a spoiler. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to um, like the presidential campaign, well, any presidential campaign, where if you're a Democrat, you're told, even if you really like um, the Green Party candidate, you can't actually vote for the Green Party candidate because you'll just take votes away from the more establishment Democrat, Democrat right. and you'll inadvertently help elect, let's say, Donald Trump, 
Okay, so let's use names. So you can't vote for Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, because you'll take votes away from Hillary Clinton and help elect Donald Trump. And then on the right, you're told, and you can't vote for Gary Johnson, the Libertarian candidate, even if he's your favorite, you just can't vote for him because you'll take votes away from Trump and inadvertently help elect Hillary. When you don't have instant runoffs and you don't have majority winners, you can't really have a lot of effective third party competition because they are spoilers. As soon as you have final five voting, then you could run candidates as independents, Green Party, Libertarian, Forward Party, and they would not spoil anyone else's race because they could just be ranked, you know, on that same ballot and they don't waste votes or take votes away from other candidates. So you really need to have real traction for any efforts like Andrew's Forward Party, you need to change these rules of the game so we can have this competition. And by the way, let me be clear. I, I don't really have any problem with having just two parties. The problem we have is not that there's only two, it's that the current two are guaranteed to continue to be the only two re ongoingly, regardless of what they do or don't get done on behalf of the customers, the voters. What we need is the threat of new competition. As long as they think if, that if they're not doing a good job, someone's gonna come in and take their business away from them, they will then be incented to do a good job. So we don't need five parties and then all will be well. We need the current two to feel that they better get their act together or someone else is going to enter. I think that's a really, really important point to reiterate because when we've talked about this issue on so many previous episodes, it seems easier to just throw out, I hate this phrase, but pardon me, the baby with the bathwater, right? So uh, we spoke with Mark Cuban a little while ago. He's very sharp and astute about a number of things. And one of the things he said is, I wish political parties disappeared entirely because they're terrible for uh, our political system. And there's certainly a very good intellectual debate to be made around whether that's true or not. Um, there are people that point to, when we talked to Lee Drutman, and he said, you know, uh, the United States is so strange. We're the only people, only country with like two major parties. You know, Canada has at least three, you could argue, and the UK fine, it's two, three-ish, but everyone else has four, five, six. But then you look at systems like Israel, where they've got so many and they're constantly being dissolved and coalitions that don't go anywhere. And so what I think is interesting about what you're saying is it's not fundamentally that you need more parties. It's even competition within the parties and addressing a larger segment of the general population that says, don't worry that trying to get rid of just two parties and have a real viable third party is a tough, tough battle. Of course, it would be great if we had it. Wow. Wonderful. But because that's a tough battle, what I like about what you're saying is it's okay. We can keep the two party, no problem, but let's change how we elect from those parties and who competes for those parties and what they can do when they're in power. And that feels more realistic and viable in our lifetimes than sort of pie in the sky, let's have three, four, five party kind of things. Is that a fair sort of recap? It is, although once you're final five voting, you could easily have four parties. I mean, there won't be, you can get rid of the two party system easily, once you have final five voting, you may not need to, meaning competition will drive the number of parties that voters want mm -hmm. to get the results that they want to see out of Congress. So all the discussions are focused on the wrong thing. They're saying five is the right number, four is the right number, or more is better. That's not the right way of looking at it. Ease of entry into the marketplace, low barriers to entry to serve the voter is what will drive progress, whether or not they're called Republicans or called Democrats or whether, you know, you start to see two Republican parties or two Democratic parties. It's just this dynamic competition that is the real key. So I think we'll see many more new entrants and more upstart parties whether they get as big as these current two is sort of what competition will take care of. One question that just came to mind, Catherine, I was thinking about is there are definitely a lot of downsides to the system we have now. And I think the system we have now really empowers ideological minorities to hold outsized sway 
over policy. I, I, one question I have for you, and, and I'm thinking especially about racial and ethnic minorities in the United States is, you know, one could argue that our system has also given people whose views might not be represented a, a larger platform. Because if I'm a candidate who's running strictly on consensus, those voices might get drowned out. Have you thought about that? Do you have an, any thoughts on that? Yeah, we actually have a paper where um, we commissioned independent research to look at the effects of final five voting, the predicted effects of final five voting on communities that oftentimes are marginalized in the political system. So, and that came up positive for final five voting. So the, the, the marginalization is actually not predicted to occur. What I'll actually say is I predict this will be great for diversity of participation and we see it. So in Alaska, in this first race that we just had, let's just as pretend it was going to be the top five candidates, even though they just have top four, but the system now and going forward, we're going to be moving forward with top five all the time. They had the two most well-known people at the top, Sarah Palin and Nick Begich. So Sarah Palin was endorsed by Trump, and of course, we all know her. And then Nick Begich was endorsed by the Alaska Republican Party, and they're in the first two spots. Then there was an independent, Al Gross, who ran as a Democrat in the last race and had spent millions of dollars, so had widespread name recognition. And I think, I don't know, Sarah ended up at like 28%, and then maybe, uh, I don't know what Nick Begich was, but the, the mid-20s to low-20s, and then Al Gross is like at 19%, something like that. And then the next two spots, the next two spots went to the new entrants. So there was a Democrat getting about... 7% of the vote or so in the fourth spot. And she is a native Alaskan and arguably sort of a new political entrepreneur, right? She's not known, but she got into that fourth spot. In the fifth spot, you have another native Alaskan woman, a Republican, uh, sort of in the vein of Lisa Murkowski, like maybe a moderate Republican, but who didn't have any name recognition. So you have these two new entrants who if you had final five voting, we're going to then be able to make their case starting at only single digits, but getting now earned media between the primary and the general. And that gives them a huge opportunity to sort of be on the stage and over time to get the name recognition and maybe next time come in in a higher position. Plus there's nothing actually that keeps one of those people, like let's say that Republican who was in fifth place, the moderate Republican, being the one who would sort of roll up all of the disparate Republican votes. That's you right. could go from fifth place in the primary to winning the primary if that is what, a, to winning the general, if that's what a majority of general election voters want. So by lowering the barriers to entry, you're going to let these new entrants come in and they will often be people who could not afford or would not be given the top-down blessing to enter the existing system. I, I want to ask you a question. It's a little bit of a tangent, but it's important because you have a unique background of being uh, a former business executive. You come from the manufacturing sector. I'm curious, with this change uh, in focus that you have, have you thought about what the role of business should be in government? There's a lot of angst around this, lobbyists and the revolving door between government and business and campaign donations and all these kinds of things. Is that something you've thought about having been on sort of, I guess, both sides in, in a sense? Yeah, I've certainly thought about it a lot. And we actually, um, with my co-author, Michael Porter, we did write about that to some degree in our Harvard Business Review article, although in my book, The Politics Industry, we really don't focus on that very much. I focus very much just on this system of incentives. I believe, as my co-author has famously said, strategies about choosing what not to do. I focus squarely on the system. I focus squarely on these incentives of how we're going to get people in Congress who can do the job that we need our Congress people to do, which is deal with these complex problems. And the other stuff that is problematic will take care of itself when you write the fundamental incentives that drive how people get and keep their jobs and get and grow their power in this existing political industrial complex. So sometimes you can't go after the symptoms. You have to go down to root cause. Final question then. 
So if I've been listening to this and I'm a hundred percent team Catherine, how can I get involved and, and how can I help enact final five voting in my state? You can start a final five voting campaign in your state. Um, come to our website, which is political-innovation.org. And we can, you know, help you get started. The second thing is that there are existing campaigns out there that you can contribute to. And two senators freed from the tyranny of the party primary is two senators freed from the tyranny of the party primary. They don't have to come from your state. So feel free to help us out in Georgia at georgiansunited.org, in Wisconsin at democracyfound.org, in Nevada, which website I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, and please spread the word that it doesn't have to be like this. So I have a TED Talk. So if you Google my name, Catherine Gale, G-E-H-L, or just Gale and TED Talk, you will find it. And it is 15 minutes on Final Five voting. And we want people to know that we are in charge of these rules of our elections and we can change them state by state and go from believing that things are never going to get better to suddenly being like, wow, I didn't realize actually that with this one change, we can really make a big difference in what Congress delivers. So spread the word, found the campaign, donate to the campaigns that are there. Those three things, any or all of them would be amazing. Fabulous. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Maybe one last question, if I can just sneak it in. Um, because I, like I said, I find your background very interesting coming from business and then really changing to do this thing, this political thing, which, you know, in the business world, we're used to things moving fast and quick and we can, and you know, <laughs> this is slow and laborious. Why are you doing this? What's driving you? <laughs> yeah. Are, are you going to eventually run for Senate or something? Like what, what's, what's driving you here? Yeah. I'm totally not running. I did <laughs> look at running. I, I, you know, filmed some little like short commercials and focus group them. This was years ago. I wanted to run for Senate as an independent, but guess what? They can't get elected. Eventually I realized, well, it's the system. Why would I ever say that, oh, all these people in Congress are sort of prisoners of this party system and this election system that we have. And that's why we can't get anything done. But somehow I, Catherine, should go to Congress and then I would get things done. That would be like the ultimate of ego. So no, I have no plans of running. This is my highest and best use to work on this system. And I do it for, I, I could run though, because I would say what politicians say, which is, you know, I do this for my children. Because the fact is that I do do this for my kids. My son is five. We just had COVID together. Therefore, we watched a lot of movies. Um, <laughs> and one of the things he was watching was Schoolhouse Rock. And anybody who's my age knows the Schoolhouse Rock. You know, we grew up with this on PBS and there are these little songs and there's one, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. And it talks about our system. And <laughs> it made me think when he was watching it, wow, when I was young, you know, I was brought up with this great love of country and believing that America was, you know, the best place ever. And essentially that America had it figured out and that democracy was ascendant. And I describe it as a, it was almost like that I was given this gift and democracy and our country was tied up with a big red bow. And I thought it was done. And watching my son, I'm reminded of the fact that it is not done. It is not guaranteed. Our democracy is not given to us as a wrapped package. It is given to us as something that we own and that we have to protect and defend in the same way that people have protected and defended this at other points and times of crisis in our country. And I can't think of anything that I would rather be doing than doing my part to reinvigorate this great American experiment for my kids and your kids and for the world, really. That's amazing. I mean, isn't that what we're all doing, right? We want a better world to leave for our kids. Dan and I have talked about this a lot because I'm an immigrant to the United States. And I can tell you that a lot of immigrants are very, very thankful to the United States because we know where we came from and we came here and this country gives us a lot. So a lot of us, especially immigrants, really want to give back and make this country stronger. And so listening to you, Catherine, what you're doing, it's inspiring. I'm really, really glad that you're doing this. Dan and I are proud of you. We're going to do our part 
to support these efforts, get the word out, get these initiatives going in more places, increase competition, increase choice, and strengthen this, this wonderful democracy, this nation that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, for all of your insights, and more power to you. This is, this is great. Something very, very good is coming out of this. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you.